kind of tributes to some of my favorite films by naming characters that. The Bogart character in Treasure of the Sierra Madre was Fred C. Dobbs. You can't put anything over on Fred C. Dobbs, so I stole that name from that. Yes, sir. You know, uh, this was uh, my uh, seventh film, and it was really the first one that uh, the composer used, used mostly synthesized music. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what kind of equipment it was. Uh, I like to think I know a little bit about how films are made, and one of the weakest points for me is the music, because uh, I sit with the composer, and we go over the film, and we talk about where music should go, where it should be silent, what kind of music it is. Usually it's obvious. And uh, uh, sometimes the composer will say, well, should we go with horns or strings? And frankly, I don't know the difference. So I say to him, look, you lay some, side, uh, some sort of tracks down that sound good to you, and then bring them in, and we put them up on a moviola, uh, which is a machine that allows us to play the soundtrack along with the picture and then we would tweak it from there. How he actually did it was and is a mystery. <laughs> it probably was because, you know, again, you go back to, that would have been 1980 when we were doing the music, and uh, it was certainly one of the originals. Yes? How did you guys come up with the idea of these things like these flesh-eating leeches and sweat <laughs> Well, uh, I may have mentioned to, to, uh, earlier, the original script was uh, developed by a friend of mine, and he decided not to move forward on it. And he asked, or he suggested that I take a look at the script, which I did. And at that time, the alien hunter used a bow and arrow. And I wanted something a little more unique than that, so I came up with the idea of these little flying suckers that, uh, uh, you know, throw like a frisbee and uh, latch on and then eat into the person. And it was just something that I came up with. Uh, you know, what you do is you come up with an idea. Okay, I, I, I originally thought it was like uh, an American hunter or a hunter from this world who uses a dog to help him. Well, these little live creatures, I wanted to make them live creatures. And then I couldn't have them running along the ground or something, so I came up with the idea of flying, throwing them. Now, this was made prior to digital effects. Today, a guy would sit at a computer and you'd have the actor do this with nothing in his hand, and then they would add the flying thing. With this, those were all done with wires, and uh, I would have the little character in the actor's hand, and uh, they would be attached with a little tiny eyelet, a little, little very thin wire, and then he would throw it, and it would shoot down the wire toward the camera or to the other actor, and if it goes to another actor, I would have a wire, a hidden wire, underneath the actor's clothes and out, and then you would pull on that, and it would bring the thing right to target. Right? Awesome. Yes? You, you mentioned a, a friend of yours had written the script and decided not to move forward. Yeah. Um, when was the script actually written? I would say uh, I got involved in probably uh, October of 79, so we're in, in the summer of 1979. And uh, he had a couple of writers, they're, they're given credit on it. Uh, I never really worked with them, I never even really met them. Because uh, when I got involved, I, I decided to go kind of in a different direction. But the basic storyline, and the, the, their script is quite a bit different. The boy doesn't get killed in their script, and the boy is the hero, and I wanted to make the girl the hero and let the boy get killed. The scene where the girl wakes up in the cabin and walks in and she calls to her boyfriend, are you asleep, are you asleep? Uh, that's homage to Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho, <laughs> where Vera Miles walks in the basement and she goes and she turns around in the chair and it's, the, it's Mrs. Bates. Well, in this sense, well, so I stole that from Alfred Hitchcock and I dolly the camera in the same way and had the thing turn around and the girl goes back and hits the swinging light. So that was all thievery. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm curious, uh, I noticed that you had a booth copy. Was this uh, just to appear to have gotten commercial release and then you found that these people booted this out? Well, it, what you see is not bootlegged. What you see is from my personal library as the producer-director. Uh, 
this, they say, is the most uh, pirated film on the internet. Uh, I don't like that, but there's nothing I can do about it. And I don't really have the DVD rights. I own the uh, sequel rights to the picture, and it's a long, complicated series of various distribution companies. Originally, the original distributor was a, pic a company called American International Pictures, AIP. And uh, they released the picture theatrically. We did quite well in a lot of markets. Uh, but then they were purchased by Filmways. And then Filmways, just really with all within the course of maybe a year, year and a half, was purchased by Orion. And uh, I remember amazingly Filmways when they purchased AIP, they made their big announcement and they said, and we're not gonna do any more of these exploitation pictures. And I thought, well then why did they buy AIP? I don't get it. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I, I had a, I had made a, a pre-production deal with HBO. This may be getting too technical, but I'll tell you the story now. I made a pre-production deal with HBO, and in the deal with HBO, they uh, had that the picture had to play theatrically in the 10 major markets in the United States. AIP was ready to release in 30 or 40 markets in the United States, all the major markets. Then when Filmways took them over, they stopped the distribution of the picture. So I had to go to Filmways, and luckily when I had made the contract to deal with AIP, I put in it that they had to give me distribution that would uh, solidify my HBO deal. So therefore, th therefore, Filmways was forced to release the picture theatrically in the 10 major markets, which they did. And, and as I say, we did quite well. And then the picture did play on HBO. And it also played on CBS. Uh, before David Letterman, they, CBS used to have a late night uh, movie, and this was on that. It has never been put out on DVD. So unless you've got uh, the half a dozen or dozen that I brought here, your DVD is, should not be. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, I, look, it's, it, I made the picture. I want people to see it. Uh, what, what people do with it, I, it's none of my business. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was known basically, the, I, I think that the original script was called The Alien. Then it was called Alien Warning. Then it was called The Warning. Then it was called Without Warning. Then it was called It Came Without Warning. I, I think, I think most, most of the uh, uh, distribution is known as Without Warning. And sometimes in the ads they put it came without warning. But without warning is, is the title. The picture was a major success uh, in Europe and Asia. Uh, it still plays, uh, for some reason the Germans love it. It keeps playing and playing in Germany. <laughs> so I can say Dr. Shane, I guess. Uh, anybody else please? Yes. Um, do you know if there was any sort of uh, influence taken for the Predator movie? Because I noticed a lot of things that did run similar, like uh, yes. with Jack Callis' character being like, well, I have the advantage, he doesn't know that I'm hunting him. Right. It seemed very, very similar to like you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character. Well, actually, uh, Schwarzenegger gave an interview when he was uh, making Predator, and he said in it, did you ever see a little picture called Without Warning? Well, ours is kind of like that. Of course, I spent 150000 and they spent uh, probably 30 or $40 million at that time making it. Uh, coincidentally, the same actor, seven foot tall Kevin Hall, played the alien for me and played the alien in Predator. Oh. Yes, sir. I understand the alien was originally played by John Von Van Dam and they decided he wasn't terrifying enough and they got rid of him. It's a creature that's more like a bug like creature. So they did away with that Stan Winston who brought in their design of the Predator. Yeah, I didn't know that, but uh, John uh, Claude Van Damme could certainly have scared me in some movies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, is this a tougher male versus female thing? Uh, 
I'm sorry, say again? Is this Tucker and Dale versus Dale? No. I still didn't catch you, sorry. No. 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 It's not until later. We're in the wrong place. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's coming up. That's okay. You can stay. I'll answer your questions. I just don't understand. Is this is jerks that came in towards the end? Yes, sir. You can move to the My favorite genre is movies. I like all kinds of movies. I like everything from musicals to horror films and everything in between. I like westerns. I grew up in the 60s, really. Uh, a lot of drive-in movies. Uh, it was a small town. There was only one theater. There wasn't such a thing as multiplex. And I saw everything that there was. And, and I must admit, I'm a movie fan. I like everything. And as far as uh, my career, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to make, well, I've directed 20 films, a lot of different types of films, um, and I'd like to do the next one, whatever it is. Yes, sir. I just wanted to comment on what a great cast you have done. It's incredible. Uh, sort of characters. Thank How you. How you managed to get them? Well, uh, the way you the way you get an actor basically is first of all you have to be able to meet his asking price yeah. whatever that is and then secondly it has to be a project a film role or a film itself a character that he wants to play so by this time as I say it was my seventh movie uh, most of the agents not most but many of the agents in town knew me and they knew if I presented them with a project that I was going to make the movie. Because what, what an agent does not want to do with a known actor like Jack Pallance or Marty Landau is they don't want to make an offer to them and then have the actor say yes and then the picture not be made because it makes the agent look bad. So at the very beginning of my career I had real difficulty convincing agents that uh, yes, I was going to make the picture so they could go ahead and talk to their uh, client about it. But in this instance, uh, Jack Palance, I had done a picture just previous to this called Angel's Brigade, Angel's Revenge, or Seven from Heaven, it's all the same picture. And uh, Jack was in that, so we had a relationship. We liked working with one another, and he was willing to work with me again. So I had this role that I thought was right for him. I got it to his agent. We agreed on the price. Uh, the agent passed it along to the actor. And the actor, in this case, we're talking about Jack. He uh, agreed to do it, and we made the picture. <coughs> and Marty Landau, I did two pictures with him, but this was the first one I'd done with Marty. Uh, and I saw him interview on a local cable access show. Los Angeles. And he had his hair, he was wild, sticking down, and he was <laughs> rolling his eyes, and he looked crazy. And I thought, that's the perfect <laughs> actor to play Fred Dobbs. So uh, uh, I contacted him, and believe it or not, Martin Landau, who had been a star for, God, I don't know, 25 years or whatever, didn't have an agent. He had an attorney. So I contacted his attorney, and what you do is you go to Screen Actors Guild, and again, if they know you, you say, I need to contact this actor who's his agent. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, in this case, they said, uh, Mark Landau has no agent listed, he has a law firm. So I contacted the attorney. The attorney, uh, I don't think he knew who I was, but he checked with some people and he found that I was somewhat legitimate. And uh, so I got the script to uh, uh, Martin Landau through the attorney, and uh, Marty agreed to do it, and uh, we made the picture. And then, then I did another picture with him right after this, called The Return. Uh, Landau and Talent were great to work with. I've been very fortunate throughout my career that when I worked with a professional actor, I've never had even the slightest bit of problem with it. Um, in fact, you can almost talk shorthand with him. Now, you notice Neville Brand, maybe, if you guys know who he is, in the bar. Neville I had worked with on three or two. And I don't, I, this was the third picture I think I worked with Neville. Second picture I worked with Ralph Meeker. And I really like working with professional actors. 
because even though I have a low budget, I'd rather spend the money on the actor because I know he's going to be professional, he or she is going to be professional. And uh, I think I told the story earlier about Jack Palance coming into the bar and wanting to go from seat to seat to seat, and I didn't have time to film it that way, so I went to Jack and said, you gotta come in and just sit down and talk to the various people in the bar. So you can do things like that when you're dealing with real professional actors. Um, yes, ma'am. Right. The 70s, and I was, as I was watching him as the Cub Master, I almost wondered, was any of that little bit of improv? Because he just seemed to have that quality that it just seemed to flow so naturally from him, that, that humor. And that's what good actors do. And Larry, uh, Larry Storch, in addition to being a, a good stand up comedian, which he was at the beginning of his career, yeah. was also a very good actor. I would say that probably 90% of that was written. Really? But yeah, but, but when, you, when you write dialogue for the actor, Especially if you're gonna have someone like Larry Storch, I would always go to them and say, Larry, throw away the dialogue, keep what you want, what you don't like, ad lib, make it work, make these kids feel relaxed, because they were a legitimate Cub Scout uh, squad. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know who exactly, if, if I remember right, I think it was the makeup woman's son <laughs> was a member of the Cub Scouts club, so we wanted to get a bunch of Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, and she got her troop to come out, and uh, they uh, uh, worked with Larry, and Larry worked with them. He was, he was great. Anybody? Yes? I do have one more question. Sure, please. Yeah. How come nobody's thought of making the little alien frisbee thing to market itself? You know, today they would. In those days, they didn't. Uh, I've been talking for some time about making a sequel to this. Um, I have the rights to the sequel, but MGM is peripherally involved and they have filed bankruptcy and they've been re repurchased by another company and then that company went bankrupt. This is over the course of the last several years. And somebody said we should make a remake of this and those flying critters, it should be in 3D. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, uh, uh, I find that I literally have two DVDs left, including this one. Just one left. Uh, one plus one. Including this one, too. Including this one too. Yep. Uh, we have some That's posters, we have some stills, and what have you. We'll be here till uh, uh, sometime midday tomorrow, I guess. That one's the master. So thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Goodbye.